What's up? This is Dr. Taylor Crick, and today's video is about the stomach. And so it's stomach autoimmunity. It's about anemias. It's about vitamin B12. It's about iron. It's about hydrochloric acid, and it's about gastritis. So a, a lot of things packed into one video. I'm going to try to make it quick. The reason for this video, the purpose for this video, is that we see this all the time. This is really, really common. Is either you know certainly anemias we see all the time, but you trace back to why. And, and oftentimes the person's eating enough iron, they're eating enough B12, but they still show these anemias in their CBC. And so you have to think about you know, why and some of the mechanisms behind that. So the purpose for this video is so that I can send it to patients to explain kind of the concept behind what I think they may have going on. So first off, let's look at stomach, uh, shoot, stomach definitions. So uh, a few definitions, pernicious anemia, that is a autoimmune B12 deficient anemia caused by a lack of or problems with something called intrinsic factor, okay? It's an intrinsic factor binds B12 and absorbs B12. And so pernicious anemia is also what's called a, a megaloblastic anemia, meaning your red blood cells are, are too big. They don't differentiate to be small enough. And B12 is one of the things that, that makes that process happen. B6, B9, methyl groups make that process happen. So a pernicious anemia is an autoimmune process. Uh, rarely, like frankly diagnosed, but very, very common, I would say. Um, B parietal cells are the cells in the stomach that secrete stomach acid and intrinsic factor. So stomach acid, the next one down, is really, really important. And so a lot of this conversation revolves around stomach acid and improper stomach acid production is really, 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 really common. Uh, the, the first book that I ever read kind of illustrating this, which I, I still think is a good book, it's, it's getting a little dated, but it's timeless, uh, is called Primal Body, Primal Mind by Nora Gagauskas. Um, and, and it's really, really good. But anyway, it talks about how prevalent hypochlorhydria is, too little stomach acid, whereas the whole world thinks that there's too much stomach acid. The whole world is hooked on antacid, antacid drugs, antacid over-the-counters are some of the best-selling medications uh, in history, uh, now linked to things like cancers and now linked to all kinds of problems, class action lawsuits and things like that against some of them. But stomach acid is a really, really important part of this. So stomach acid is secreted by the parietal cells and it's responsible for your body to break down proteins and also to absorb iron. And so uh, along those lines too, to break down proteins. So sometimes people say, like, I I'm, not, I'm not vegetarian by, by phil philosophical reasons, for philosophical reasons, but meat just doesn't sit well with me. And sometimes that can be a symptom or a warning sign that your body's having a hard time breaking down things that are a little bit harder to digest without adequate stomach acid like meat. So stomach acid is an important part of this. Gastritis is inflammation of the stomach. Now, I put on their stomach pains. That's very common. Uh, so autoimmune gastritis, people have stomach pains. They'll be curled over. They'll be doubled over. They'll have legit stomach pains that's you know a little higher than, than say, like uh, IBS or spastic colon or something like that. They can kind of feel that it's a little bit higher. But gastritis can also be uh, nausea. So in, gastritis, inflammation of the stomach, doesn't always present as pain or like somebody's stabbing you. Sometimes it does, but it can also be nausea and just this feeling of being unwell or feeling kind of sick to your stomach. Then heartburn or reflux, the feeling that stomach acid is traveling up the esophagus and causing a burning sensation, which can damage the esophagus, can lead to something called uh, Barrett's esophagus, where the tissue you know, eventually changes, uh, things like GERD, uh, gastroesophageal reflux disorder. There's all kinds of different names for heartburn and reflux. There's also silent reflux. We're not getting into all the details of all these things, but we're talking about the mechanisms by which they function, because when you understand the mechanism, no matter what name you've put on it or your doctor has put on it, silent reflux or esophageal reflux or heartburn or what have you, uh, no matter what name you put on it, the mechanisms stay the same. So autoimmunity, the autoimmune process, self-tissue 
um, antibody attack can really bother you know multiple things lots of different things things that we probably haven't even studied yet or know about but two big ones autoimmunity can attack the parietal cells which secrete the hydrochloric acid secrete the intrinsic factor and, and then can lead to things like iron malabsorption or problems absorbing meat uh, low protein things like that or it can attack intrinsic factors so these are common auto antibodies that can be measured especially intrinsic factor but very common auto antibodies um, and so intrinsic factor can cause b12 malabsorption can cause pernicious anemia can also cause autoimmune gastritis other important factors just in this conversation we can't have this conversation without talking about h pylori or helicobacter pylori this is the most common infection in the world um, it's very, very common to have. It's very, very common to have and then your body gets rid of it. It's very common to pass it around family members. It's very common that maybe you could eradicate it, your body could eradicate it and, and you pass it to your kids or your dog or something and then they pass it back to you. It's easily transmitted. Very, very common worldwide. Uh, so when you have enough stomach acid, that inhibits the growth of H. pylori. So having good stomach acid, uh, you know, limits your risk of getting H. pylori. But then what H. pylori does is it burrows into the stomach lining and it decreases acid production. So it's going to alter acid production and then it can burrow into the stomach lining and kind of eat away at that stomach lining and cause ulcers it's the number one cause of ulcers worldwide uh, but h pylori very common infection can be detected uh, through the blood through a serum uh, test for to de detect it then it can also be done through a stool antigen to kind of see if it's been eradicated in different things but h pylori as an infection is associated with Hashimoto's and and other autoimmunities through um, molecular cross reactivity uh, and so are parietal cell and intrinsic factor antibodies. So very common in Hashimoto's, very common in MS, very common in RA, just very common with autoimmunity. When we run what's called a multiple tissue autoimmune panel from Cyrex, we'll commonly see stomach problems. And in other times we don't run that panel, it's a, it's a pricey panel, but we'll see things like I mentioned, like um, you know, maybe a higher MCV, like a megaloblastic anemia or a lower hemoglobin. We're gonna talk about all these things in a second, but we'll see signs that maybe somebody's not absorbing iron as well as we want them to, or they're not absorbing B12 as well as we want them to, or they're not methylating and we'll see things like homocysteine and you know, et cetera. So here's a graphic that's really, really great. Um, I put the citation next, but so autoimmune gastritis. So the bottom of the stomach, you know, the stomach doesn't really sit like this, like perfectly upright, but the bottom of the stomach, autoimmune gastritis uh, affects the fundus and spares the antrum. So autoimmune gastritis more affects the top of here, which is where a lot of reflux symptoms can, can really stem from. So in the parietal cells over here, we already went through this, they produce the acid. The acid helps with iron absorption and protein breakdown. They also produce intrinsic factor, which helps with B12 absorption. So autoimmune gastritis, the parietal cells can get destroyed. Then you can get iron deficient anemia, or you can get B12 deficient anemia, uh, or the intrinsic factor can be attacked as well. Um, and different things happen in this autoimmune gastritis. Here is the uh, citation, uh, pathophysiology and lab diagnosis of pernicious anemia in mechanisms of autoimmunity. So when you have stomach acid imbalances, a lot of different things can happen. So uh, I'm not saying hypochlorhydria, hyperchlorhydria. A lot of times symptoms of hypochlorhydria can mimic those of hyperchlorhydria. So just know that hypo, not enough stomach acid, is incredibly more common. Um, but yeah, reflux, heartburn, all those common things. Uh, some other things that stomach acid is necessary for, adequate stomach acid triggers the, the valve at the bottom of the stomach to open. 
And if it doesn't open, then all the acidic contents in the stomach are more likely to be kind of regurgitated or travel back upwards if that valve doesn't open. They just kind of sit there longer. So that can be a trigger for, for heartburn or reflux, and which is, like we already said, one of the most common symptoms in the world. Stomach acid, we mentioned, helps break down protein, but it also helps neutralize the bacteria. So if this is your stomach, and here's that valve, and here's the hose underneath it that is your small intestine, when that valve opens and that stuff comes through, the acidic contents of that neutralizes any overgrowth of bad bacteria in the small intestine, known as SIBO, or small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, one of the most common causes of lots of different things, but especially bloating, bloating, brain fog, fatigue, uh, all kinds of stuff with SIBO malabsorption. Um, and then also adequate stomach acid production triggers things like bile release and enzymes from the pancreas because the way that the digestive process works is from north to south and it all has to happen in a very specific order and one thing triggers the next thing first we see food then we start producing enzymes then our mouth starts watering then we eat we swallow we start producing acid and pepsin and all these different things gastrin and then it goes to the next step and then the next step and then the enzymes and then the bile and then etc so if one step is broken it can throw off all the others and stomach acid being one of the first steps can throw off everything south of that. Um, stomach acid problems can sometimes be detected uh, by basic lab markers, just on like a CMP, a metabolic panel, things like total protein, um, things like even uh, calcium sometimes, uh, just different, different markers uh, that indicate uh, hypochlorhydria more often. Uh, and, and also there are a few at-home tests that you can do that kind of can help you determine your stomach acid production. So one of them is the, uh, we use the Institute for Functional Medicines version. So it, it's basically like you take a capsule of hydrochloric acid, see if you get a burning. The next meal, I think you take two, the next meal you take three, the next meal you take four, and you keep upping it until you get a burning. And at that point, that's kind of your tolerance. So if you were able to take you know, four capsules without getting a burning, that means that you have a pretty good need for stomach acid. Uh, another one is a baking soda test where you put like a, I don't know, maybe a teaspoon or something of baking soda in water and you drink it. And if you don't burp within five minutes, you may have low stomach acid. And, and sometimes these tests completely contradict each other. Um, so I don't know what to make of that. I just kind of assume most people have low stomach acid. You know, if, if people can take stomach acid support uh, without any ill effects, um, we, we will use it um, if we suspect a problem. Um, and then the Heidelberg test is a little more invasive and, and you know, more insurance-based stuff. You swallow a little pill that, that I think has a sensor um, in it and kind of sits in your stomach and senses the stomach acid le level. So there are some ways to, to kind of determine that with stomach acid imbalances. Iron malabsorption, if you're not absorbing iron very well, it's going to show up as iron deficient anemia. And iron helps build hemoglobin and hemoglobin helps transport oxygen from your lungs to your tissues. So if you, let's say, are anemic, you're not going to get enough oxygen out to your muscles. You walk up a flight of stairs, you might have to put your hands on your knees and, and take a breath. Like, oh, boy, I'm really out of breath. Uh, or you might get brain fog or you might have fatigue. Those are the number one and number two symptoms. My sister, I always remember, had been, she's a, a division one basketball player and like a like a star, so she played you know, the entire game basically, um, rarely sat, and, and she was really, really anemic. So she had gotten kind of sick and, and, and nobody really knew, um, but she was like really, just really tired and just said, I, I don't feel good coach, like I'm so, so tired. And you know, they whip them into shape, they train all year, all year round, uh, she's in top physical condition, but she had been fairly anemic. Um, and so that could just affect anybody, especially menstruating women, uh, for obvious reasons. If you lose a lot of blood each month, there's more likely chance that you're anemic. Um, and so, yeah, this is a huge thing. My wife was anemic when we had our second birth, uh, our third kid. We have twins. 
um, but our second birth, we had a home birth, and if she was a little too anemic, it, it was against the state law to have a home birth. Um, it had to be done in a hospital. So we tried some, we found out kind of late, um, and we tried iron supplementation. We weren't able to get the levels up high enough, so she got an iron infusion. And I'll tell you, that day, she was like, what? Like, this is how I'm supposed to feel? Like, she felt so dramatically different. So iron's just really, really, really important for mitochondrial function, for kind of everything. If you're not getting enough oxygen to your tissues, you know, you're going to die um, and other things. So on a CBC, which most people have had, you can detect this. And there are different ranges. You know, the lab ranges are going to be broader. We look at functional ranges. So rarely is somebody, frankly, outside of the... Uh, outside of the lab ranges, but the functional ranges are tighter ranges. So where I want somebody to be on an ideal level is, is a little bit tighter range. It's not diagnostic. We're just looking for signs and indications. So red blood cells, um, you don't want your red blood cells to be really too low. You don't have not enough of them. You also don't want them to be too high because if the body isn't getting enough oxygen, it'll produce more red blood cells to try to keep up. Um, but that can be problematic too. Hemoglobin, uh, that's the main marker. Um, hematocrit is HCT, um, MHC is mean uh, hemoglobin content, uh, MCHC mean corpuscular hemoglobin content. So both of these are just like, all of these I should say, are more like how much uh, hemoglobin is in the red blood cells. I, if you've ever seen a CBC, I left off MCV because that's different. That's looking at red blood cell size, mean corpuscular volume, um, and that's different. That's more the B12 side of things, but looking at how much hemoglobin are in your red blood cells, that's really what we're looking at here. That is the most common you know, way to diagnose uh, anemia is through the CBC and the red blood cells, but it's really, really important if you want to get a full picture of iron metabolism. I think it's really important to get a serum iron um, and also a, a TIBC, a total iron binding content, uh, and a UIBC, those usually come on the same panel, and a ferritin also. And ferritin is storage iron. Ferritin is also an acute phase reactant, so it's an inflammatory marker. But sometimes the body's storing iron away for some reason, and it's not using it in the red blood cells, and we can have just you know imbalances in iron metabolism seen on a, a $5 CBC and a and a you know, $10 uh, iron panel. A B12 is more the pernicious anemia, um, and sometimes they'll, they'll call that or diagnose that without actually looking at the antibodies. Um, but pernicious anemia means megaloblastic. It means the, the, the red blood cells are too big, um, and that means they don't get small enough. So that's looked at through MCV, which is mean corpuscular volume. So mean corpuscular volume of 96 is this big, uh, MCV of 90 is th this big, you know, and so you want smaller red blood cells uh, to a degree. Uh, B12 deficiency is most commonly associated with fatigue. You know, if you stop 20 people on the street and ask them what B12 is good for, they're going to say energy. Um, and so a lot of people, you know, know that methylation, homocysteine, transsulfuration, all these things, uh, lots of things require B12 uh, cobalamin. Lack of B12, I guess this is down here, is, lead to methylation deficiencies, which can also lead to detox issues, neurotransmitter imbalances, depression, anxiety, fatigue, hormone problems, and a whole host of other things, as well as homocysteine accumulation, which is an inflammatory marker and is a heart attack risk factor. Here are a couple labs uh, from Cyrex that we do that you know also have 22 other tissues on them, but the top two are the stomach antibodies. So here we see mild autoimmunity against intrinsic factor. Here we see a pretty hefty autoimmunity uh, against intrinsic factor. So what can you do? So you first off, you need to get a lab test. I mean, uh, that's the easy part. Um, and just know where your iron metabolism is. And what we do with our patients is, you know, we, we have to try things. You know, we try try one pill a day. Then let's retest it. And, you know, with women, sometimes we'll say, let's go, you know, two menstrual cycles and, and let's retest it and see if we're adding as much as we're losing and see if we can get this balanced out. Sometimes we need to go to two a day or we need to go to more a day. Sometimes that causes constipation. So we need to figure out a way to try to increase iron. There's a lot of trial and error. So you can do that, of course.
You can try the at-home tests. You can try the IFM stomach acid test or the baking soda test. You can just take stomach acid support. You know, this is the one that we use that is actually, it's private labeled, so we called it stomach acid support because we weren't allowed to call it hydrochloric acid or, or betaine, uh, betaine hydrochloric acid with pepsin, I think it has. Um, and that is just betaine hydrochloride. Uh, that's pretty common, stomach acid support. Um, oh, you can take B12, liposomal B12. I say liposomal because if you take it in a pill and you have problems absorbing it through the stomach, you might not get it all. Uh, liposome under the tongue, you're going to absorb more of that. Um, or if you have this going on, you, you first of all, you can test. I guess I skipped out. You can test for the antibodies. You can confirm this, especially if you have autoimmune gastritis. You want to know the cause. Um, but you can try to calm down your autoimmunity. And there's a lot that goes into that. We got a lot of other videos on that. That's a complicated puzzle. But you can take things like vitamin D, turmeric, fish oil, resveratrol, glutathione, balance your immune system, heal your gut, detox, stress management, uh, autoimmune paleo diet, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There's tons of things to calm down your autoimmunity. So uh, that is the stomach in a nutshell. Uh, really, really common cause for complaints, uh, top selling medications, some of the top symptoms that people experience, the heartburn and the reflux especially, but very, very common in the autoimmune picture, uh, which is just you know so prevalent today. So hope you got something out of that. Enjoy and share it with a friend if you enjoyed it.